Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi We're back. We're doing a part two now, an extension from uh, the previous discussion. As you can see, um, the panelists have not changed any costume, <laughs> no makeup, nothing. You've not even changed position because we've been enjoying ourselves. Um, and off camera, we've had a discussion which I think now needs to become now needs to come on camera. Yep, let's do it. Uh, with the language, of course, being a bit more tailored for our our viewership. Inshallah. So beginning with Hafiz Ab again, um, uh, Hafiz Fahim, to start us first. You made a beautiful point off camera. I think everybody was in awe. Mm. Yeah. The, so go on. So sadaqa. We talk about sadaqa and all these things. Yeah. The the point was merely just for Tawji, who was just to to direct and orientate us all. The reason why tensions can be high and emotions are high when it comes to asking questions about this is because sadaqa, as we mentioned, it just from a linguistic point of view. Morphologically, it comes from a word Sidq, honesty, integrity. Shalom. And we need to maintain and we need to ensure, as give, givers and dispensers of charity, that that integrity is maintained at all times. Because the objective is not merely just giving, the objective is pleasing Allah and fulfilling the commandments of mm. Allah as He mm. has stipulated within the law and how the ulama have then uh, further commented on. So that's the tawjid that I wanted to give that this is about integrity and we want to get to the best integral point. We want to see that charities are more uh, transparent and we as uh, givers are more well informed, mm-hmm. we are informed. and as, we as transparency would, would, would grow then of course figures will grow as well we'll have more trust in the 100%. charities that uh, locally are, are, are working around us we would actually be more confident in giving to them and and uh, in the bigger picture inshallah that would then uh, the, the, the trust will build we'll be able to support more people sure. and inshallah we can then build a healthy community where what Imam Sa was alluding to on, on, on my left was that, especially for the youth coming through, now in this mist and this 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 cloud of ambiguities mm-hmm. regarding all the, quest- the, the questions around the, the charity sector, at least they'll have some more clarity, wouldn't it? I think when you put the word Muslim on anything, it comes with a heavy responsibility. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really just be a charity, just be something. But when you say we're a Muslim charity, or when we're presenting ourselves as Muslims, when we're starting with Aslam wa alaikum, when we're talking about brothers and sisters, I think therefore there's a further obligation on you to be much more scrupulous amongst yourself. Mm. I think all I'm saying is when we put the word Muslim, it's not a light word. Yeah. To be a submitter to Allah is not an easy thing to say. But you have to then give yourself that same um, nobility in your action as well. Yeah, and we're in the month of uh, Ramadan. Ramadan is all about attaining the quality of mm. scrupulousness. We want to we want to attain that. And so that's why we're really focusing on this. Uh, do you want to introduce our... Well, it doesn't need an introduction, guest. really. <laughs> doesn't need an introduction because we're Jahad Bai, uh, still here on the uh, hotspot. Yeah? Yeah, still here. He's still here. Ready to go. You managed to keep him here. We managed to keep him. No, actually, he actually wanted to stay. No, I, wanted to stay. I feel like there's, there's, there's a lot more to flesh out on this topic and it's quite important, inshallah. inshallah. So, inshallah. So, let's start, Bismillah. So, what okay. are the things that we didn't answer that we kind of alluded to? I think to? one thing that we left a bit hanging was well, the Armelene question. Bismillah. Yeah. We back and forth between yourself and Wajahad Bai on the Armelene question. Yeah. So, so let me start off. Go on. The reason, the, the question that, that was asked was, uh, when it comes to zakah, Allah has very explicitly defined who is eligible for zakah. Do you want to just go through that, that short list first? So point. Allah mentions in uh, Surah At-Tawbah mm-hmm. yeah. that lil wal masakin. You must make this mad, by the way. Ibn <laughs> Mas'ud he corrected someone. He said we, we read with this mad. wal masakin. وَالْعَامِلِينَ عَلَيْهَا وَالْمُؤَلَّفَةِ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَفِي الرِّقَابِ وَالْغَارِمِينَ وَفِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَابْنِ السَّبِيلِ okay. and, he, and Allah has described specifically a number of categories and one of those categories that the zakah is eligible to give to which it would translate as the amilin, the workers, the charity worker and the reason why I asked that question before and I'm going to ask it again but a bit more clarity was the verse was revealed in a context and mm. it's in, in the context of having an imam mm. and mm. only an imam like someone like Ozu just leads the prayer I mean Imam who is the leader of the religious and, and political affairs of the Muslims. A the hakim. A hakim, whether it's the Sultan or someone who works under it, whether it's the Khalifa yeah. or whatever it is. And so traditionally it's the job of the Imam to appoint who is the Amin. Okay? And the Imam's tradition were always people of the highest quality of integrity and the highest quality of Islamic knowledge and jurisprudence and understanding anyway. Uh, and so now we're living in a context we don't have that. Okay? So if any Tom, Dick and Abdullah can just join a charity <laughs> or form a charity, okay, and he has the right to uh, choose who is a worker, who isn't a worker, mm. the question I'm asking is that right? 
is that even valid in the first place? Yeah. The question isn't about whether the money reaches the people. The question is about is he eligible to take yeah. from that? Who said he's eligible? Is his income halal thereafter? That's the question that I really wanted to get. Who is the amil? I guess and a simple way to answer this is like in Kitab al or, or wherever else throughout might be in fiqh, is this stipulation made that a person, a hakim, should be the one that's delegating this task? Is, is that a requirement? Um, yeah, in, does, some does fiqh, in some fiqh it is, yeah. Then I guess that's the answer done. That is yeah. very important. And if any Tom, Dick or Abdullah is going ahead and doing this, you don't have the right to do so. Yeah. So in the, in the absence of that mm-hmm. hakim then, mm-hmm. What do we do? Because after the abolishment of the Khilafah, yeah. the Ummah is still suffering. Yeah. Oh. And how we are suffering is not just because we lost a bearded person who is leading the Ummah, mm. no. Mm. Actually, the, the Khilafah represents an entire government. Yes. Mm. The Khilafah represents the Awqaf, the endowments, Awqaf. the Islamic Ministry of Endowments. Mm. Mm. And, and that's what we're really suffering with as an Ummah. It's not that we don't have a political direction, mm. that, that we want Caliphate and we want all these things as Muslims, no. It's the fact that we we don't have this in, endowment. We're deficient in that. So yeah. the question then is, as we alluded to about Islamic scrutiny, yes, are we then saying that one of the potential fixes in this is to have a an okaf to have a, a ministry of people who are looking 100%. over the religious affairs of our community, like we have Sharia councils, like we have you know people overseeing other nikah, talaq, etc. Mm. Should we have? A board of people who are looking at our finance and these in, in, in not only charities but riba with credit cards yeah. with financial loan agreements with yeah. mortgages are we now coming into an mm. arena so, where we need to look at you know how, finance? Far, how far this goes in, in the olden days i heard this from a syrian scholar that this is the level of scrupulousness they had when the, the awqaf Allah. system existed the mufti would be paid by the awqaf mm-hmm. okay his food would be bought for him okay the t- the, <laughs> the times of his meals would be decided by the awqaf why? So that he has one purpose in this world, and that is to master the jurisprudence. You understand? They would choose what food. Why? Because the food could impact his level of thinking. It could make him lazy. It could make him think a certain way. No smart the times he couldn't write the he could he couldn't write the fatwa at a certain time if he's just eaten, or yes, if he's hungry. Tiredness. You understand? So the awqaf. One of the things that we lost when we lost the awqaf system was this scrupulousness within our scholars. You understand? That's what it was. So, they would regulate the imam's performance. Everything. In every way, privately and publicly, yes. and that's what we are really missing, really, isn't it? And so now I'm gonna come on to. Some okay, but before that one, Imam Sato, you know, you mentioned the 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 fuqaha or the imams doing playing this role, or having a body of scholars that would regulate charities. The question really is, in what capacity? Mm-hmm. Now we already have a charity commission, mm-hmm. which is doing that. Are we really saying that we need a board of scholars who would sit on a on a table alongside the governing bodies of like, the likes of Charity Commission to regulate because that's the only way they will be recognized. In the ideal world, yeah, that's what we want. How yeah. practical is that? Very, I'll tell you, very it's practical. Unrealistic. It's unrealistic. It's unrealistic. Not realistic. It's unrealistic. No, yeah. it's not. So, that's, so then we go back so to Sharia Council. Coming down then. Yeah, so Where? coming down is, is basically a more Sharia Council way. So we know that uh, uh, Nikah is not a valid form of accepted marriage in the UK. So therefore, if two people have Nikah, you have to go to you know, someone to register or whatever to mm. get recognized. So mm. we don't have that. But when we talk about an Islamic level, we all still want to operate though according to Sharia. Yes. Which has the Muslims living in the non-Muslim country mm. and these people are watching thinking, oh, they want the Sharia law. Here it starts, creeping Sharia. Sharia. Um, and they're scared, oh God, these bearded men want this uh, Sharia. And they're starting to ask questions. They want to sit with government ministers. But just to be very clear, there are bishops in the House of Lords. So there is a, the mm. God Squad, they call them. So there always has been a religious element in Parliament. Yeah. Um, and yep. so... Looking at this, we want to live, and I think this is something that we have neglected as a community, but we haven't been there yet. Maybe we're getting to that space mm. where we need to start looking internally at the affairs of the Muslim and say, well, it's not a government aren't going to do it, but we should do it for ourselves. We should have a level of scrutiny available for ourselves. We're not going to do it on a level which is, mm. you know, like you said, with the, with the khalif, with the mastering it. But we're going to have at least something we can be accountable to Allah. Yeah. Isn't but that what, what it's about, Sheikh? That's what it's Being about. accountable to Allah, saying we so. tried our best. But what level of authority would they hold? But this is the problem. So a Sharia council is not accepted. It's not recognized only, anyway. It's not recognized except by the people who use it. So then you get into sectarian problems. Well, who, which imam is sitting on it? Which sheikh is sitting on it? <laughs> yeah. He's from the, this masjid. He's from that masjid. So you start to get into problems. So this is where, if the, the ummah could work on, on, on something alongside the charity commission, or anything, any board that would be recognized by government, that would have a leg to stand on. And then when they speak, it actually speaks for everyone and everybody has to then abide and they are held accountable. 
No, I think, look, I, I, I want to say the Charity Commission, look, looking at the way they operate, it is semi-scrupulous. But I think from an Islamic, we always want to be with act with ihsan the mm. muslim is the best yeah. the muslim yes. is the one that goes further and so like we talked about before it might be that the charity commission say well this is okay but from an islamic perspective well actually we want a bit more we want a bit more transparency and it's okay to ask to be better okay to act with ihsan so what i'm saying is maybe it's not necessarily from a governmental perspective it's just for an oversight and sometimes it's important to have that level of oversight within a charity let me let me throw a question in then um and i think you probably have more more knowledge on this how do other religions regulate their finances? Oh, I wish I knew. I had no idea. Do, I, okay, do, so do, one thing I do know actually. Has anybody thought of that? So what one, is there like question. a working model that we can... There is a working model. Go on. Go the on. working model is in Australia. Ah, oh, Bismillah. Go on. Australia have an Al-Qaf system. Oh, do they? Recognised by yeah. government. And they have a Grand Mufti. Mm. In fact, the former Grand Mufti is one of my teachers, Rahmatullahi Ali, Sheikh Tajuddin Al-Hilali. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Allahu an. He was one of the students of our teacher, Sheikh Saleh Al-Ja'fari as well. And one of the most positive aspects of, of what they do there is the Awqaf announced the moon sightings. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another out outcome of it as well. Okay. So positive. Australia do have these things and they have managed to find a balance between what we can say a secular society and Islamic law and incorporation. Mm. Is it the Australian Fatwa Council? Yeah, the Fatwa Council. Yeah, I've seen I see it here. Well, they recognise I mean, by they, a lot of so them. Their imam has always been an Azhari scholar. So I see over here before Ramadan they announced the Nisab. Was yep. Zakat and yep. also they announced the as Zakat of Fitr Rahman yeah. as well. Yeah. So, um, so these are the Australia countries. being an extension of UK. But, but um, just to remind you, we do have the same thing for Europe as well. Which is and the Fatwa charity Council. I used to work for was advised by uh, one of the members there as well. Lurpi Fatwa Sheikh, Sheikh Abdul Al Judeh. Yes. So he's yeah. the one that would sit down with us and give the Zakat uh, workshops and yeah. he well, would. That, he, well, that's he the would thing. We don't want to make it personal. Well. Sheikh Al Judeh, he's he's not respected by many many other scholars. This is as this well. is the thing. So he follows the uh, minority. Could you not could you not say the same thing on Australian Fatwa Council as well? Any of Probably. Fatwa well, this, the Fatwa Council Australia they elect Imams from Al Azhar University, which is an authority in Islamic knowledge. In the that's, Muslim world, that's, yes. Yeah, that's another thing, yeah. In the Muslim mm. world. But these are the challenges. There's going to be definitely challenges, but mm. we need to work towards something is what you're trying to allude to. Uh, yes, I think what we're trying to say is, should we always want to act with the with the best. I think one of the positive, I mean, we'll talk about the positives of the uh, sector shortly, but I think just getting back to this idea of scrutiny, just because, you know, other people aren't watching us, we should want ourselves to be better. Definitely. And, and I think one of the things that we're saying is, I don't have any um, objection to anyone who's scholarly to come in and look at the books to come in and ask questions but all charities doing that regularly and i think it's something that we should be encouraging them to do and if they do do it then alhamdulillah and if anyone's not doing it then maybe there's something they should consider and we have a working example of that in our sunni community yeah most famously Dawat islami okay yeah, very good they have a board of uh, muftis mm -hmm. that regulate all the finances that comes into Dawat islami yeah. how it's coming in and how it's going out all of our charity at the warrington islamic association Three yeah, I mean, the, the amazing. I mean, about for, for, for several years, uh, on paper, they've always been regulated and the, the transparency is there. Yeah. And because they always have anything that they do as an organization, the first contact point is Mufti Saab. Yeah, this is what we're about to do. And you know, the anything is, they do, Mufti Saab, from the, the volunteer level to the top, wow. they're all people of piety, of integrity, who, sure. who observe the Brilliant. outer sunnah. Mm. That's what what's what, what's really beautiful about the FGL. So there are good practices. So what we're saying is there are good practices. There, there, are, there are charities there are out there. There, doing some there are people doing some amazing things. And mm. most charities look, Allah knows intentions, isn't it? And I don't think you know. I would I would pray that no one goes into the charity sector wanting to kind of fill their pockets. I don't think no. that's, that's not what we're saying. We're not saying that. I don't think mm. there's mass kind of fear that people are benefiting because it is a lot of hard work. So one thing I want to then allude to is what I said when I started a charity because one of the things I saw. And this is another question that we can speak to brother our, our guest we have not spoken much yet so i want to throw this to you you know we do a lot of work with inter, on the inter, international scene right yeah mm. and so we look at sadaqah and people look at the people in the uk and say well muslims here don't need it but we talked the other day again i keep repeating about the level of poverty and the, the level of need within the within the uk mm. plus we have people regularly and imam sahib will know in the massage they'll come got nowhere to stay got nowhere to sleep and i think we're lacking I mean, in a huge charitable causes in the UK. Mm. Is that true from your experience? Um, and also, are we moving towards a more people giving to the UK? And I just want to make a caveat before you answer. I, you know, raise money for students who are specifically in Greater Manchester to support them. But I always say when I go to funders, funders regularly ask me, but do we really need it? 
do Muslims need it here? Mm. And there are people who need it more. And I guess that's the question that we have to ask ourselves. What is the state of the Muslims in the country? And I will always say, look, anyone around the world, Gaza, Pakistan, Yemen, Bangladesh, wherever they may be, give 90% there. But we need to start investing some of our money back into the UK. Definitely. And when we could, when, and then now a question for the, the Mashaykh, the, the Imams amongst us, Zakat. Zakat is something which, you know, Lash Zakat Foundation will tell you, 99% of Zakat is given overseas. Mm. Now, from the Hanafi perspective, what is a what yeah. is this idea? Of, it's a good I, question I, I, to ask. I came across this passage and I've shared it with the, the quite a few active members of charities and accountants uh, when they asked me this question. Ibn Abidin in his fatawa describes that it's makruh to give zakah outside of your city when there are people eligible in your city to be receiving and recipients of zakah. This is the Hanafi text. So when a lot of time our when we think of charity with husband, it's like abroad. The first thing that comes to mind is somebody in Pakistan, somebody in Yemen, because uh, that's what we're most fond of, of, of giving. Is that charitable work happening to support Muslims locally? There is. There's, there's mashallah, there's, there's very good charities. Uh, one that I love is called Hugs. It's spelled H-H-U-G-S. And uh, they, they help, um, especially those uh, when counter-terrorism was, was, was very rife. It still is today. There are many people that unfortunately their homes are broken into, they're locked up, they, they leave um, a wife at home without a breadwinner, the child has PTSD, wet in the bed every time, oh, he no. has a, oh, no, no, a, no. A, a police siren going off outside, and she, she doesn't, he can't even afford fixing the door hinges now after the police broke in, this kind of stuff. So um, wow. Hugs is doing amazing work to, to help you know um, minority communities like that, mashallah. So there are charities like this that exist, um, also on the community level that help food banks and, and homeless, etc. as well. But um, to answer your question, um, because I come across a lot of cases personally um, mm. in the locality of people that need help. And it's in my opinion, both on a local um, level and also global level, it's not such a case of people needing a, needing a handout, rather they need empowerment. Uh, what I mean by this, I'll give one or two case study examples. One is this, there was a, a gentleman who came across my way through a, a mutual friend who was struggling to get his permanent residence inside of the UK after being here for about um, 10 years or so. Um, so I think that would affect him in terms of like um, insecurity of knowing if he's going to get deported back to his home country or if he's going to be able to stay in the UK. He's building a life here, he's got a wife who's a bit unwell, he also has children too. So he, his case came to my table and then he said, I need £4,000 for uh, one thousand pound for the legal fees mm. and three thousand pound for the application process itself. I said to him first and foremost, "Why are you paying one thousand pound for a form to be filled out? You can do this on your own, or I can probably find some a lawyer to do this pro bono for you as well." Mm. The second thing is, worst case, you can't pay for this fast fast track to get your residency um, for, um, application done. What's going to happen then? He said, "Oh, I have to wait about ten months then." Then I said, "Bro, I'm going to be honest. I don't believe too much into your case." I said to him straight, I said, it's going to be very difficult for me to fundraise for your case. I think there's easier ways for you to go about doing this. SubhanAllah, two to three months later, he gave me a call. He said, he said, watch, um, I took your advice. I did the form myself and my application has been accepted. And I have permanent residency in the UK and um, I can go apply for real work and this kind of stuff. Sorted. I'm going to say something probably a bit controversial that mm -hmm. some people might not like. And I go back to what I was alluding to. How mm. can we sit here looking at the state of the Muslims? and say there is no need here we initially look people came to this country in immigration was if, not all but a lot of financial immigration with the intention that economic migrants with the intention that we come in get some money go and buy some how many Pakistanis still buy land how many people are still building a life back home that their children are saying well that's not back home for me at what point are we going to have as a Muslim community to say you know what we're here now we need to establish ourselves but we need to be the best. Why am I still seeing levels of poverty that are unacceptable? Why am I still hearing of cases of students? Let me give you a typical example of a case that comes to the charity that I work with. Mm. At, the, at the university, yeah? University, college, high school. You have a, a, a so I'm gonna call her, let's call her Aisha. Aisha will typically apply living in a, a, a M 18, 19, 13, 14, some of the most impoverished postcodes in Manchester. Uh, 15 years old, her father passes away. She has four siblings living in a house with a mother and four other siblings. Her mother is traumatized by um, the loss of her husband, mm -hmm. doesn't work. Father was the breadwinner. Yes. Now, Aisha has to now get oh, a job no. when she's uh, working in college or mm -hmm. a university. 
um, half of a wage goes to the family to pay for food. Um, you know, people say, oh, but government, the government, let me tell you something about government. People will say, oh, the government give money. It's not enough. And I think this idea that benefits, benefit fraud, benefit, benefit, benefits are not covering money anymore. They're not covering even food. That's why we have so many food mugs. And so then the case will be, she'll come to us, I have to go to university, I have to travel, I have to maybe walk an hour and a half a day, an hour and a half back. I work on the weekends and now my laptop's broken. I can't work or but I can't travel and it's causing a lot of stress for me and it's causing anxiety. I've got exams coming up and I need to cut my work. When you hear these stories, well, I was sat there and I was in tears. We have, you know, no, no, no. if thought every day at the university for three, four, five hundred students, people are struggling. And I guess what I'm saying is as a Muslim community, as the Muslim charities, I implore that we start looking at more and more UK based projects. And I think Definitely. we need to really understand the level of demand and need for zakah and um, zakat and uh, sadaqa and some of the supporting guards. Because what I'm saying is, these are the future leaders. Our youth are the future. Yeah. And if we can empower them, they will be the future sadaqa givers. They will be the future zakat That's givers. Mm. And exactly. this will then benefit the ummah around the world. Mm. But I feel like we have, as a Muslim organized charities, neglecting the, the country we're li living in. Yeah. Why is it that we don't have provision for homeless Muslims? Why is it that we haven't got provision for X, Y? Why are we always outsourcing them? Why is the masajid the only place that people can go to? And let's be honest, they can't do everything. How much more uh, um, can you give? But when the charities are sucking up the money of our community, when they're taking from the pockets, at what point are we going to start giving back to the people who are here? Yeah, yeah someone it. said to me that there's, there's so much money going towards Gaza, but not all of it is getting in. Mm. Understand? So you're right, charities are taking more for projects that it's not even reaching there in the first place. So why not we mm. divert some of that yeah. back to... I bump into to somebody home, yeah. almost every week at MCM. Imam said, this is my situation. Not going anywhere to stay. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was with my family, uh, with my mother. Uh, at a local supermarket and I saw the brother just wandering around the car park just wandering he saw me with, with the topi on Islamic attire he didn't know that I was the Imam of the Masjid and he goes I've just come and, I, and he asked me look if there's anywhere to stay I said look let me ring around and find out and then he, he asked which masjid you're going to uh, is, is there any masjid he said that's the first question he asked is there any masjid that could allow me to stay just for tonight where was the brother from? from Egypt Okay, and then I said, look, he said, I said, look, you don't know me, but I'm actually the imam from the masjid. So let me ring somebody's there. He goes, I've just come from the masjid. And everybody has said, look, there's nothing available at all. And that guy was shivering in the cold. So I rang a few people, the, the, the few figures we know in our community, yeah. nothing available. So, a lot of, so another issue we have, of course, you know, the hype of just getting to the UK. Mm. Which is another whole discussion on its own. <laughs> just somehow just get to the UK and then we'll You'll make it. it. You'll make it. Yeah. yeah. But once they actually land here, they realize there's nothing available here. And it's yeah. cold. And it's cold. <laughs> it's freezing cold. And I mean, uh, living, work, everything. Look, we as a community are suffering as well. Just like the entire globe. Globally, there's there's a um, what's the word I'm looking for? A crisis. Mm. UK is going through the crisis. I had as well. a figure about number of Muslims living in poverty in the UK. Go on, share, share those figures. For the, the the thing with this now is because uh, like like I said, so a case has come to my come to my door, right? And I realized that because we live here, it, we don't just necessarily have to give them money and say, okay, go sort yourself out. Rather, it should be a system where we're able to empower them, get them back onto the right track, and, and this kind of stuff as well. Mm -hmm. So, what what one of my dreams is, to be honest, um, I, I wish I would have the time to start this. Maybe I inspire someone out to do do it themselves. Is be that focal point, be that contact point where you can at least get someone started, maybe get them a bank account, get them on, on benefits at least to begin with. We're talking about extreme cases, not like the one that you mentioned, so that we get some money into the account. Maybe we can analyze what skills they have and mm. get them, you know, working again. Like the brother I mentioned before, I asked them what, what skills and stuff he has. He goes, I'm actually an accountant. Then I go, so why are you working in a hotel as a receptionist then? He goes, it's quite hard to find work. I'm like, bro, just get into your LinkedIn, spice it up. Maybe you can get um, work to do from home so you can look after your wife as well. It doesn't restrict you having to work just in the weekends. Is that this is the kind of knowledge that people need. They need that empowerment. Mm. So this is really the, the avenue that I want to go through. And also in addition to that as well, uh, many people contact me saying, oh, watch, I've got, I've got adult diapers or I've got um, clothes that I want to send to Gaza. Can you facilitate this? I say, no, it's, it's very difficult to get aid into Gaza in the first place, let alone figure out logistics to send your stuff from here mm. all the way to Egypt, to then, then to go there. 
I go, but here's the number of a sister who's much like running a local charity over here mm. where she's mm. diverting the things that you don't need to people that are, that are in need, whether it's, it's furniture Fantastic. or it's baby clothes that, that kids um, grow out of in, within the space of just a, a few weeks. Um, stuff like this, which we would say is useless to us now, is very useful to someone else. So absorb it into the community. And what I would encourage everyone to do that what does one take on this kind of Amir position is become the Amir of your street in itself. Mm. How often do we go to our neighbors not come to I'll be honest, like I'm Mashallah. speaking about first, myself first and foremost. Mashallah. I don't know past three three houses from my house. I don't know who lives there, subhanAllah. But it's actually the non-Muslims in my community that set up a WhatsApp group uh, as like a bit of a home watch saying, Oh, someone's alarm's going off, is everything okay? Or saw an ambulance over here. Um, um a, a Amazon driver hit my car, did anyone see it? Then they post in the wow. what do you call it, the rings? The Amazon rings to, to send video evidence of what happened so they can report it. All this kind of stuff. This is what we need for every single street. That's Start right. just on your street itself. See who's living there. See what people might need. You know, give them a cup of sugar or something like this. This is where we need to start. When we say charity starts at home, start in your own house, then start with your neighbor. But it's it's said facts. It. It's yeah. facts. He is not a believer who goes to sleep with his with who goes while to his sleep, belly is full. But his belly is full and his neighbor is goes hungry. That's it. That's he is not a believer. This is something which we have to understand the essence of what it means to be a mu'min, to be a Muslim, to be a believer. We say it, we'll easily give 10, 20, 30 pounds to someone, but we won't even look at the guy next door to us. And sometimes it's quite shameless. I live, um, you know, where, where, where I am, there's a brother who, mashallah, subhanAllah, I saw him today, and he does everyday food banks. Every day he says, on Saturday, three, 400 people are coming. And, and he says, Allah just give. We've never taken a penny off anyone. Allah will give. Allah mm. will find us. And someone will oh, donate to us. So and we're giving to the you people. You just take that step. And they distribute. If you take one, Allah will do everything else for you. We have to make some effort. We have to support each other here. And absolutely, we need to give to our brothers and sisters all around the world who are suffering. Allah, he's a suffering, inshallah. Mm. But we have to also look at the people that are around us. And I'm thinking we need some of us. Some of us need to have a spotlight. On our communities because the reality is imams we're the ones who are facing the people every single day mm -hmm. and we need that support as well to be able to, to help yeah, them there's been it, times when people knock on our doors and, and you're, you're stuck as an imam like who do i actually call now i've got nothing except to point. Turn that if we pull in our resources yeah. we can do so much so, but someone has to take the initiative any volunteers inshallah look we're all here inshallah. 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 Well, let's, let's let, we should discuss this you know this this is where we need to start to start with one community right now in old traffic we can start here code. i can start with start with my own street Inshallah, and then we can see who has the resources available, you know? Someone might have a business which is currently uh, empty for whatever reason. It can be a home for five, six homeless people, for example, you know? So there's there's, there's mm. ways to go around this. Mm. And there's applications as well, amazing ones, um, like Olio, for example. If you've got leftover biryani that you don't want to eat anymore, and you're going to get takeout instead, and you know it's going to go off the next day, you can put it onto the app. And then someone will literally contact you saying, I want this food, like where do I come pick it up from? It, oh, it exists. Okay. Oh. It exists, and uh, even businesses as well. Anyone that owns a takeaway or something like this, um, it begins with T. Too good to go. Too good to go. Too That's good it. To go. Perfect. Too good to go. They will package it as a cheaper option. So instead of selling like five burger meals for like twenty pounds, they'll be like, "Look, this is going to go to waste." Package it as five pounds, and then um, that's food for an entire family now. Just a oh. fiver, mm. you know. So these these solutions do actually exist. We just need to popularize them, inshallah, yeah. and also start working together as a community too. So you know, we, we know, for example, I know Saeed the Zafullah Shasa from Birmingham. Okay. He has a uh, food bank, 24-hour food bank. So what he does is the local uh, wedding halls or banquets, food that that's left, left over, rather than throwing that away, or restaurants that cook fresh food on a daily basis. So from the previous night's sales, they've not made enough or they've got plenty left over. They he would then have people that would come and drop the food off to him. He then packages it or leaves it in a in 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 an um, outdoor fridge freezers mm. where people just bell him, and he quickly heats it up, and then gives it to the homeless. Oh, Allah. Allah. And Shah Sab is doing some incredible work. Allah. In fact, Allah. his is the only food bank bank which is running twenty four hours in the UK. Wow. Anybody could ring him. I even three a.m. and and he's got you know that 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 doorbell system where you ring the bell. Straight away, his phone rings. Mm, like some, somebody's ring, on the, the door. Ring, yeah, the ring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, he lives two minutes walk away from the masjid, mm. from, from where his centre is. Visit. Walk across, heat it up, here you go. Yeah. I think this is what we need to also focus on. There's so much good work being done by our community, alhamdulillah. Mm. You know, oh, is, we need more of it, of course. Of we course. do, of course. Look, we can always be better. We can always do more. If, if we start with just food, for example, that's one big worry of people's minds. Mm. Like, it costs us hundreds of pounds more just if we keep our bellies full, you know? Mm. If, we can, if we can take away um, that worry from people, then that's at least one place that we can start. Then we can think about clothing, you know, furnishing, all this kind of stuff. And energy, energy. I mean, energy. People, uh, you know, 
you call it energy poverty but you know people are not able to heat their homes yes people are you know sitting in their houses with their coats on because they can't you know mm -hmm. uh, to the heating on or the lighting on and i think yes, these salam. when we get to this stage i think we have to ask ourselves a question where have we become you know, as you know subhanallah i bought an electric blanket like a year or so ago apparently it costs like one p per hour to keep that thing on and if it, you know there's a there's a saying that instead of heating the home heat, heat yourself but someone might not have like 20 25 pounds to buy an electric blanket well if you can provide that to them that's the whole solution in itself to keep someone warm at night mm. so the massage do need to up their game definitely, uh, definitely. in order to how, how they can actually give back to the community and putting a, a prophetic touch to it <coughs> messenger <coughs> salatu was <coughs> migrated to medina munawwara what's the first hukum after salam and if we use that honestly there's so many people that come close to islam through charity that that muslims give and if you're feeling somebody's stomach or a family on a daily basis imagine the number of people that are you actually appealing with just that religious uh, incentive yep. Yep. and then you it, it opens room for having discussions so they'll ask why are you so charitable that you bring this hadith and you bring in the character of the prophet so, so, so. you you slip in a, a translation of the quran and before you know it they went on the way. Huzur, what's, what's the concluding message that we're giving to the people? I think the, the, the concluding message, one, one extra thing before we conclude. Uh, I wanted to personally hear from Wajahad Bai, from some of the recent travels he's done. Yep. Uh, and also, so inshallah, highlight the positive the work that's, that's, that's gone on as well. Of course, we, we've scrutinized charities for the last hour and a half <laughs> quite a bit. Uh, that's why Wajahad Bai has been, been on, on the hotspot. But in terms of, of on ending on a positive note, mm. the type of work charities are doing and some yeah. of your own experiences. Yeah, of course, um, you know, it's very important. I mentioned this before as well, that when you go in to help people, it's not about a savior complex. It's not about your ego. If anything, it's a beautiful act of worship. Okay. Like, subhanAllah, I think I had Mufti Meng say not so long ago that you be thankful for poor people because they have given you this opportunity of a unique form oh, of worship yeah. and giving sadaqah to them, subhanAllah. And then, um, you know, when you when you go on these trips, it's more about what you're receiving in return, especially um, when you go on places like Lebanon or to a Syria border and you're hearing from some of the most oppressed people on the planet. The hadith um, says, what Prophet said, that Allah there Allah is Allah no Allah. barrier between the dua of the oppressed person, doesn't matter what the religion is even, mm. no dua, no hijab between the oppressed person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept that dua Allah is answered. Allah. So when you're going and you're giving them a food pack, for example, and you're giving them the ability to uphold their pillar of siyam, and you're also, of course, mashallah, giving you a zakat and upholding your pillar there as well. Then know that every time they're opening the 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 rosa, every time they're opening the, up their fast, and they're making this beautiful du'a from the fasting person, and also that on top of the fa of the oppressed person as well, you are the one that's in the du'as because you gave them this ability to uphold the pillar of Siyam, which is so absolutely incredible. Us, so this is extremely um, important is, to understand that the power of, of your zakat, of the power of your sadqat, the power you're able to give um, the people as well in, in empowering them and uh, what you're receiving in return as well. We talked about calamity before and, and how um, sadaqah can save you from that, which is absolutely amazing. A couple of stories from the field, I guess, um, subhanAllah, it, one of the ones is actually from Togo, Africa. Um, on one of my first first trips there about a year and a half ago. Uh, we went uh, into the field uh, an hour or so from, from the main city and when you go just half an hour out, Moeen was there with me as well. You start noticing people are already carrying, you know, the containers on their heads. They're going to fetch water. They're living in not the best homes. And slowly, slowly gets worse and worse to the point where it's like mud huts and like there's stone ages. There's no Wi-Fi, electricity. There's literally nothing. It's crazy how people are living. So we went to do a rice distribution. Literally, just a bag of rice into the hands of like um, the community village we had there. About 500 beneficiaries. And um, it was, came to about midday. It was about six, seven hours since we ate our breakfast. So we were all hot and sweaty we had some food and um, delivered to us from uh, one of the restaurants in the city and uh, for the for the benefit of the beneficiaries you know we we went and hid behind our vans we tried to seclude ourselves so you don't see us eating um so we had like chicken uh, like a little bit of chicken peas some rice some salad a fizzy drink as well to wash it down and we all just dashed it onto this bin bag and returned to the field to continue our distribution now we went we did distribution we we're all moving away from the village and my boss comes to me and says, oh, why do you want to believe what happened? I'm like, what is it? He goes, when all of you guys went back to do the rice distribution, this one African uh, Togolese lady actually came to me and she saw that we were eating and that we put all of our rubbish in, in the bag while I was clearing away all the mess. She came to me and said, please give me that bag. And he was like, Allah. he was like, no, you know, you don't want the bag. It's just rubbish. She goes, no, 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 please give me that bag. 
Because that is food for me and my family tonight. Oh, no. Allah. Talking chicken bones, maybe a little bit of string on chicken on it, um, some salad, which you would f- feel is just only suitable for the bin now. Someone else is saliva in that food. You know, this is what she said is food for her. And this issue of hunger did not actually make sense to me until I heard the story myself. And that was, subhanAllah, I was there as well and giving this food to the people. And it made me think like, you know, uh, my mother would always say when I'm sat on the dinner table, you know, Waji, make sure you finish your food because there's people in Africa that don't have food. That sentence she always used to say to me only made sense to me that day, subhanAllah. Allah, you know, Allah, 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 Allah. That it cannot not move your heart. Wallahi, when we, um, we think of the amount of luxury we're in, we're kings. We're living like a modern king. When are people who are pleading to get some food off a bag, a bone, and we waste food. The amount of food we waste, the amount of money we waste, and we talk about poverty, Allah has not given us that level of poverty. May Allah protect us from that level of poverty. I mean, Sadaqah is a burhan. It's like uh, a hadith mentions, and, and I remember reading that in, in Mishkatul Masabi, who my father, and both of us, once we read it, we actually stopped. Which hadith? The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam described that if you've got a roof over your head, and you've got a cloth over your back, and you've got food in your stomach, then consider yourself to be the luckiest person on the earth. Allah. SubhanAllah. And we both stopped for a moment. And we paused, we looked at each other. Look, we're actually kings. These fucks. The fact that we have a roof over our head, we've got a cloth over our back, we've got food in our stomach. You're a king, you have no reason whatsoever in the world to complain about anything. The example of what Jahabai is giving, there is still hunger out there, isn't yeah. it? I'm, t- I'm only talking about like, Togo, Africa right now you know nowadays we're so versed with the crisis with Syria or mm. with Gaza, Palestine where they're eating grass and this kind of stuff you know subhanAllah there's one time um, I was inside of an orphanage in, in Lebanon and this like, Nakba was when 1948 right mm. so imagine that people moved from Palestine to Syria to seek a, a new life and then it kicked off in Syria the next generation and then they moved to Lebanon and then they're starting a new life so they've gone from Palestinian to Syrian to Lebanese so I was with this one orphan girl who, who came in from Syria and uh, she was talking about, oh yeah, my, my mom and dad are from Syria and then my grandparents are from Palestine and uh, she's really bubbly, she's running around with us taking selfies on her phone, um, she's dancing and all the rest and then she just sat down with one of the brothers and she said, Ammu, you know, there's one thing I really, really want, bearing in mind she's an orphan, there's one thing I really, really want more than anything in this world. He's thinking, you know, this girl's super excited, she's super bubbly, maybe she wants to be a pop star or become like a doctor, has some big dream. And he said, you know, Ritaj, which is what her name was, what is it you want, really, really, really want more than anything in the world? And she replied, Amu, I just want my dad back. Allah. Subhanallah. And then her mother came out shaking and then um, she was like, yeah, this is my daughter, Ritaj. And we just asked her, like, well, tell us a bit about your story. To which she responded, Subhanallah, I, my, my husband, he, he was killed inside of Syria. And our 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 our, Qari, our our village and city was under attack. So I took all eight of my orphans and I fled to the mountains of Lebanon. I wanted no, to find a new no, life in no, Lebanon. No, no. And she said, when I was in those mountains, there was literally no thing, such thing as any relief coming on our way, no food, no nothing. I just had a few scraps left. And every single day, I had to make a painful and impossible decision. Which of my eight orphans is it that I feed today? Allah. Which of my eight orphans is it that I choose to keep alive today? And in making this impossible decision every single day, five of her children passed away, Allah. including infants. And today only three are alive. Mm-hmm. And you know, when I think about that Togolese woman that was eating just chicken bones and this disgusting salad and stuff, I thought to myself, this mother who's probably starving herself, she was probably giving food with mold on it. And I've seen this myself when I was in the Syrian camps. This is in Syrian camps now where aid is actually reaching them. I asked my colleague um, Adil just to open the fridge when, when he went to the camp. The stench that came out of it, it will never leave me, oh. subhanAllah. There was more mold on that plate in the fridge than there was actual food. You know, and well, I, dear brothers and sisters, you know, for this sister, this widow that lost five of the kids, we as Muslims, we could have been there for her, you know. But we can't be there for the next people. I don't say this to depress you, rather to tell you that, mm-hmm. you know, when you see a charity that is reliable, you see a charity that is given the transparency and given the reporting, do not fear giving, you know. Well, we should, and I think it just reminds you of the yeah, verse yeah, of Allah. Yeah. We should be very grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think hearing these stories, 
reminders of being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fact that we are able to have what we think is just basic is not. It's the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's something oh. that we should we should be thankful for every single time we make dua, we pray, we should always be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because in ungratefulness there is a big sin and there is a big calamity that can be. We should be proactive, not reactive we, to be absolutely things. proactive. Be ready, you know, be aware that there are Muslims around the world who are suffering here and all around the world. May Allah e- make it easy for them, inshallah. Amen. Amen. And I think hearing these beautiful stories, you know, inspires us to give. And we should give because Allah will never, you know, Sadaqah does not decrease your wealth. Mm. Allah himself has shukr. Whatever you do, Allah will not ever go to We this. should always be grateful and we should be thankful. And when we do a good deed, we should do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And know that charity does not make you poor. Charity increases you in your wealth and it's a test. It's a test to say I have so little But if I give a little back then Allah will increase me so much more sure. and may Allah make it easy for all of us and May Allah um, reward all the people who do the good works in this life and brother Mujahid who's going around the world doing all these things and it's an inspiration inshallah So I think there are good lessons we can take from this podcast about how we can maybe move forward as a sector as a community and how we should feel but I think subhanAllah half sub if we end on the I think uh, enough in, enough said that in shakartum la azid annakum. My own personal experience, um, uh, students and, and some law, I run my own business and stuff like that as well. What I've always seen again and again that whenever you've given in charity, hand uh, on heart, uqsim billah, within 24 hours, I've seen more work coming. Wow. Subhanallah, brilliant. Hand on heart, whenever you've given in the form of charity, Maybe as, as as little as whatever number you want to think of, or as big as, as I possibly can. It's within 24 hours I've had more business. So hard. It's incredible. Like I said uh, at the beginning of the podcast, charity is from the, 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 those hikmas of that, that only Allah knows how it works. We will never be able to comprehend how charity works. Mm. But having that trust of what Jahalba is mentioning, not every charity out there is wrong. As long as you're doing your due diligence and, and what uh, Jahad Bhai mentioned in the, in the previous podcast is as long as the, they being as transparent as possible. Yes. If they're reporting back to you mm-hmm. after a few months or after a few after a year, you're getting images of that well or those students that have now graduated or have now progressed, then you know that's a charity that you can trust because there's a level of transparency, scrutiny and reporting. And inshallah there will be khair. The rest you leave with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Allah will accept your your your, your, your donations. Amen. But I want to mention the final point, which is to come back to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Sunnah of the Messenger Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is to give with your own hand. If that is a source that's available through somebody you know, who will then know somebody who will know somebody, and it will get into the hand of someone. For me, adherence to that Sunnah is the most prophetic way most sound way and it big, brings most content to my heart. If that's possible in the community, in your community, you, you will all know mm-hmm. that, you know, you, you give your zakah. Traditionally, what would happen, you would give your zakah to your father. Mm-hmm. Abaji, here's my zakah. Do what you're doing with it. Your father most likely will know somebody back home where you've come from, that you will know somebody there, it will get to them. That is the ideal way, honestly. And that is the closest you can get to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if inshallah, I think Afiyah and Khair lies in that as well. Oh, Barakallah. Thank you, Mujahid Bhai. You're welcome. Uh, for getting us all so emotional at the end. And, uh, part three or what? <laughs> part three. I don't think I've got the energy after hearing those stories. I know. For, for a part three. Oh, sorry. I love the best you guys. I'm dead in the crowd, my bad. Jazakallah. Okay, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh.